Ryan over at Two Minute Tennis. One thing, if you like what you are seeing, if you like what you're watching here, be sure to give a super thanks. Uh, you'll see it down below when you're, and when you're gonna comment, you can throw a super thanks, so thank you so, so much. So a couple things. First, this live, uh, you know, please put your comments in. Um, I wanna make it not just about technique or not just about strategy or not just about footwork, but I want it to be kind of whatever you want it to be. Uh, so yes, we're live. I would love it if you commented uh, and a super thanks is always absolutely incredible. Um, so throw your, your questions below and I will do everything I can to answer your question when it comes up. Let's talk about a couple things with strategy. Uh, you want to think of single strategy in really simple terms. There are five situations in singles, uh, five situations. And they, hey, what, Will, I'll answer your question in just a second. The five situations in singles are you're serving, you're returning, you're rallying back and forth, your opponent's coming to the net, and you're coming to the net. So you want to think of single strategy that way that it's not super complicated. Just know the situation that you're in and then play accordingly. So here's one simple strategy that you can use with each situation. First, you're serving. Please spend more time having a consistent serve that you can rely on rather than just thinking about speed. Get your first serve in the box. If I want to make a YouTube video and have lots of views, I talk about serve speed, you know, hitting a faster serve. But in reality, a fast serve where you're only making 30% or 40% of them in is not going to help you win more matches. So to win more matches, you got to figure out how are you actually going to get that ball in more often. So you should be, and you should track yourself with your matches, you should be somewhere between 60% and 70% first serve percentage. If you're making half of your first serves, that's not enough. Get up around 60% at least and figure out what's the magic speed and aiming strategy, right? Don't be missing your first serves wide and your second serves wide. If you want to start hitting more powerful serves, then hit faster serves, but aim to the middle, right? Because it's very difficult to hit your fastest serves and aim way out wide. Let that be a serve where it's a little slower so you can maybe get a higher percentage in. But if you're gonna be going for your big serves and your fastest serves, aim to the middle. That gives you margin. That helps you be off in your aim but still keep the ball in play. Quite, uh, idea number two, and then I'm gonna start answering some questions here. When returning serve, you know, let me ask you, what percentage of the time do you aim your return of serve? What percentage of the time do you aim your return? I teach my students to aim back to the server. If this is the server, if your opponent's serving and they serve to you, are you aiming back down the middle actively, especially against a first serve? You should be. You need to aim back down the middle to increase the likelihood that you make your return. Plus you pin them to the middle and you reduce the angle they have on their next shot. All right, let's go. Here we go. Hey, is hitting to the backhand uh, the number one single strategy? I really wouldn't call that the number one single strategy. I would say hitting with depth is the number one single strategy, Will. Depth is the killer, right? Depth is the number one way to force an error. The way you get depth, Will, is by aiming higher over the net. When you hit the ball higher over the net, the ball naturally, naturally lands deeper. Will, that's a great question. You are better off hitting deep if your opponent's right-handed. You're better off hitting deep to their forehand than you are hitting short to their backhand. So depth is number one. You want to go out and rally with people and see how close to the baseline you can get the ball to land. Uh, of all the different ways that you can force an error from your opponent, hitting the ball hard, hitting with spin, taking time away from your opponent, hitting with angles, hitting height over the net, depth, all those ideas. The number one way to force an error from your opponent is depth uh, because the ball gets to your opponent in less time. When a tennis ball bounces, Will, it slows down. Tennis balls don't speed up when they hit the ground. Otherwise, like, 
you would hit the ball, you would hit a serve at 100 miles an hour, and it would hit the back fence <laughs> at 130 miles an hour. Tennis balls don't slow down. Friction doesn't make things go faster. So it's gonna slow down. Well, the, the longer you can delay that bounce and that friction of the ball hitting the ground, the longer the ball is traveling at its faster speed. Plus, if you can make the ball land deep, then it has to come off the ground and they gotta take the ball off the rise. So that's really difficult. So depth is the number one rallying strategy if you wanna talk about it. Um, and, and so Will, that's a great question. Let's look here. Do, do, do. If there's one thing to take into a match about my forehand, what would it be? I would actually tell you, Muhammad. Uh, uh, hey, oh, hey, Audi, <laughs> I, I see who it is. Um, so the, uh, the idea is simple. Um, it's about hitting the ball higher over the net than your opponent. So what I like to tell people is, on average, be the person who hits higher. Uh, and the reason is depth, consistency, keeping the ball away from the net. Uh, it's so common that players try to hit their forehand harder when you actually want to be kind of piggybacking what I said to Will, is you want to be the person who hits the ball deeper. And you actually do that by hitting the ball higher. Now, when it comes to with, with a forehand, we can produce a lot of topspin on the forehand. So that's why it's good to hit with height because then you can get that ball to then come back down. No questions, just all the best. Hey, thanks so much, Alexi. I really appreciate it. All right, let's go back here. Guys, if you love these live videos, I don't do them often. If you love all the content that I put up on YouTube, it would mean the world to me if you were to throw in a super thanks, uh, especially if I respond to your question, that would mean the world to me. Oh, I accidentally got rid of my, uh, my things here. Uh, I get a lot of topspin on my second serve, but it doesn't kick wide. Any tips on how to increase the kick? Yes, absolutely. Let's talk about this. All right, I'm going to unplug. This is what I want to do. I don't just want to do strategy. I also want to do uh, advice on making a topspin serve kick. Let's talk about this. Do I have a tennis ball? Here we go. I got a tennis ball. So let's talk about how to make a kick serve kick. First off, the kick as a right-hander is making the ball jump off to the right. The way you get a kick serve to kick to the right as a right-hander is to keep your body sideways. So if you open your body up too much, you are going to get topspin. That means the ball dips down and then just goes forward from its, from its uh, original like direction that you sent it. But if you stay sideways and your swing is very much from left to right as you hit the ball, what all of a sudden happens is that ball has some cockeyed spin. And instead of just having top spin, it kind of has left to right spin. It almost, the ball kind of travels like a football, you know, like an American style football. The ball has a bit of a spiral to it. So then when the ball hits the ground, the ball actually jumps to the right. So if you want your kick serve, yo, what's up, AA? In order to get your kick serve to kick, really work on staying sideways as you hit. If you look at Federer, for instance, on the ad side, when, which is when they're very much sideways, when they're done hitting serve, Whoa, oh my gosh, best channel on YouTube. Look at this super thanks. Oh my gosh, thank you so, so much. I really, really appreciate it. That was incredible. Thank you so much for the super thanks. Uh, that, was, that was absolutely amazing, absolutely amazing. Thank you. So as you're hitting the ball, we want to spin and keep the body to the side. Feder, when he's done hitting the serve, his pronation points the strings to the back of the, the back fence. He doesn't swing toward the target. He stays so sideways, Roger Federer and his kick serve, that he tosses behind him, keeps his body to the side, and he spins up the back, and the strings actually face the back fence. So really, really important that you are able to keep your body to the side to get the ball to kick off to the right. Absolutely incredible. Uh, what's the best way to beat a moon baller? Uh, I just keep losing to them. Yeah, so common. Look, you're not gonna beat a moon baller by the two of you staying at the baseline. And you're probably, to be very honest, it's gonna be very difficult to beat a moon baller going to the net. What you're actually looking to do is hit short and bring them up. If you hit the ball short and uh, low to them, uh, and let me show you this. Here's the shot that your opponent, let me plug in my phone, because if I don't do this, 
my phone will eventually die. I, I make YouTube and TikTok and Instagram videos all day that I always feel like I don't have much, uh, much power. If you're hitting back and forth and this moon baller hits super high and they're a pusher, the shot that a moon baller and a pusher does not want you to hit to them is this. That's what they don't want you to do. They Like on a return of serve, when they put a serve in, just hit a short ball to them and bring them up. Moon ballers and pushers typically do not like to come forward into the court because their shot has been practiced from way back here. Their ball is way back here when they hit that. So then what happens is they come in, they don't like this shot, they typically don't like coming forward. Oh my gosh, thank you so much. Your super thanks are amazing. Who was that? Brad Hall, thank you so, so much. I so much appreciate it. Thank you, Brad. So when you come forward into the court, what then happens is they hit the shot and they typically start going back. And that's when you hit hard because then they're stuck in no man's land. You want to hit short on purpose and bring people in because then when they uh, come in, they hit the ball, they start backing up. Now you hit hard, you pull them and then you push them and then that screws them up. Do not hit hard to them because the harder you hit it, the more they like it. And then they just blew the ball back, hit the ball short on purpose, bring them into the court. All right, let's see what we got here. Thank you, Brad, so much. Uh, for a, uh, what is the proper footwork for a two-hander short high sitter on your backhand side? Let me see this again. Uh, tennis with Andy. What is the proper footwork for a, oh, to handle a short high sitter to your two-handed backhand? Yep, let me show you. When you were dealing with a high short ball, and I'm going to have to thank you so much. Thank you for I, I, uh, I'm just going to say Karthik. All right. Thank you so much, Karthik. I really appreciate that. Super thanks. That is unreal. Thank you so, so much. You guys are being awesome. All right. So here is how you deal with a high short ball. You get a high short ball. You want to come in like this. A high short ball. You want to step in. Let me tilt my, my thing down a little more. You want to step in, you want to step onto your front foot, and then you hop like this. When it's a high short ball, you lean. Once you lean, it's kind of like a, um, a hockey uh, like slap shot. The foot kicks back, so you have to hop on that shot. So you get a high ball, you lean, you hit, the foot kicks back, so you have to hop on that foot. You will not be able to bring, you will not be able to bring your back foot forward. Uh, when you hit the shot. That's why you have to hop because you're leaning forward. So you lean forward on that front foot. Uh, I just bought my Topspin Pro. That is awesome, guys. That's amazing. Thank you so, so much. Uh, thank you so much, Efren. How to deal with fast-paced ball. Oh, use your code. Thank you so much, Efren. I can check right now. I'll see. I'm sure I got the notification. If you just bought it now, uh, I just got my notification that you used my link. Uh, how to deal with pace. Look, you're not gonna deal, what's up YouTube, ultimate YouTube gaming. You're not gonna deal with pace by hitting it hard. You're gonna deal with pace by hitting clean contact and a short, slow swing. If somebody is hitting the ball very hard to you, just take a nice, easy, short little motion and use their pace against them. So many players try to fight fire with fire and they have someone who hits the ball hard, so they try to hit hard back. You don't wanna be the person hitting hard second if that makes sense. You want to be the person who's hitting hard first, or if they're hitting hard at you, you take a nice, easy, short swing. No need to, to blast it back. You want to control that ball. All right, let's go here. Uh, I would love to study under you, man. I'm a very de dedicated high school coach who is dying for more professional development. You know what's so funny? Okay, Cody, this is so funny. I was just talking to my wife um, this morning saying, gosh, I really want to create my own certification. Um, so I, it's actually in the development. I've been working on it for two years. I have the entire thing written out. I'm using a, a platform called Thinkific. You ever heard of Thinkific? Um, it's a place where you can create, it's kind of like Udemy. Um, what's another thing that's like that? But it allows you to create a course. I have the entire thing written out. Now I'm just making the videos for it. It is extensive and it teaches you how to analyze technique so that you can start your own stroke analysis business the way I do it. 
Uh, so yeah, how to beat a pusher, Samantha, I just said it the other uh, minute here, and it is by hitting short and low to them and bringing them up. So when you return serve, you're looking to bring pushers in. Um, thank you, Cody, you'll be the first customer, that's awesome. Uh, and, and I am going to be doing some live Zoom. Like if you go to my website, twominutetennis.net, create an account and you can get on my email list. Um, I, I will be, and Samantha, I'll answer your question in a second here. Cody, I will be creating very soon courses that you can sign up live on Zoom where I'm going to teach you how to, you know, teach strategy, how to teach footwork, how to like to high school kids and to beginners and intermediate players, how to analyze technique for your players that you can, you know, have a stroke analysis business. So look for that. It'll be happening definitely in 2022. But Samantha, how to beat pushers? You want to bring them forward inside the court and you want to do it with short little shots. Uh, so if you're returning serve, hit a little slice short ball that will absolutely, you know, uh, frustrate the heck out of them. All right, let's see here. Uh, what do you think is one of the most important strength exercises? Thank you so much, Andy, for the super thanks. You guys are awesome. We've had a couple super thanks come up here, guys. It means the world to me. So thank you so, so much. Um, so I want to get back to that question that I was just reading. Um, exercise to a, a player can do to improve their serve. All right, Danny, look, I, I would be remiss to not explain this. If you're a coach, you need birthday hats because the birthday hat, we got 102 people on here right now, which is awesome. If you're not use, if you're a coach and you're not using birthday hats to help your students with the serve, you're really missing out on the way pros maximize their level of play and also amateur players. And the reason is because unicorns cannot serve correctly because their racket would hit the horn. So I'm gonna give all of you two things. One is about leg drive and one is about racket path. When it comes to the racket path, you need to learn how to move the racket in over your head. You move the racket in over your head while serving, which knocks off a birthday hat. And you wanna knock the birthday hat off from front to back. This is like that saluting motion that you see. Look at um, Nick Kyrgios hit a serve. Look at Roger Federer. Look at uh, um, Naomi Osaka, uh, Sam Groth, the fastest server of all time. What they do with their racket is they pass their racket in over the head. John Isner, their racket. Oh my gosh. Thank you so much, <laughs> Yvonne. Thank you so much. I love like the Superman guy. That's amazing. Thank you for the super thanks and super stickers. I so much appreciate it. Thank you. You guys are freaking awesome right now. So you want to get the racket to knock the birthday hat off your head. That instantly gets you away from the waiter's tray. If you are not currently, if you're a, um, if you're a coach, if you are currently not handing out birthday hats to your customers, you want to ingratiate them, put your logo or put your phone number on the inside of a birthday hat and say, here, this is the best thing. You can get a pack of these. You can get like 20 of these for like $3 at the, at the dollar store or whatever. And then all of a sudden they have a way to practice their serve and they've got their website or your phone number on the inside. Just put a sticker on the inside and then they can at home practice using the circular path. The next idea that's gonna improve your serve guys is proper leg drive timing. You have to make sure that you are driving your legs up at the right time. Here's the way you do it. And you can, you can incorporate and integrate the, the birthday hat idea with the leg drive. Let me explain. Proper leg drive needs to occur, you need to be driving your legs up before you hit the birthday hat. Watch the pros. Look at, um, uh, look at Taylor Fritz, hit a serve. He, when he's at his lowest point, his racket is here, and then he begins driving up, and then he hits the birthday hat. You watch most recreational players. Thank you so much, Yvonne. We got another Yvonne. We got two Yvonnes with the thumbs up. Thank you so much. You guys are, you guys are amazing right now. Thank you so, so much. What you see with a lot of recreational players, and Cody, I think the high school coach I was just talking to, look for this with your players on your high school team. Many of them will drop their racket down and while their knees are bent, and then they'll explode up. You do not want to explode up with your body when the racket is down in the, in the drop. You want to begin exploding up just before or as 
your racket hits your birthday hat. So it's vital that you explode up because what happens is you want the body going up as the racket goes down. You want the body going up as the racket goes down. What you don't want is for the racket to be down and then they go up together because you're not getting a shoulder stretch. You want the body going up as the racket is going down. That means they're going in opposite directions. You get a bigger stretch in your shoulder and then almost like taking mashed potatoes on a spoon and flicking them at your brother at the dining room table when you're a kid and getting in trouble from mom. That's kind of what happens. You drive up with your elbow, your body explodes up as the racket goes down, and then you got this rubber band that, that stretches and then snaps, and you get a tremendous amount of racket speed. So it's critical that you use the birthday hat and you create the proper motion, that proper circular motion with your elbow driving up, creating 360 degrees so you can really swing fast. But you gotta make sure that your leg drive happens at the right time. So toss, begin bending the knees as you lift the racket up and then begin driving the legs up prior to the racket hitting the birthday hat. Right on about the leg drive. Thanks, Scott. Yeah, so many people, they bend their knees and explode up, which is great. Um, but what ends up happening is they don't, um, uh, they, they don't drive their legs up at the right time. Who is your favorite player and why? Uh, not even close, Pete Sampras, because he always went to the net. Watch Sampras points and videos, you know, Pete Sampras, like, he, you know, watch um, the 2001 match between, it was just before 9-11 happened. The 2001 match between Sampras and Agassi, I was just watching it two or three days ago, where no breaks of serve occurred. They held serve the entire match and Sampras won 6-7, 7-6, 7-6, 7-6. Um, so it was, it was pretty cool. I, and I love it cause I love people who go to the net. Uh, let's see here. What's up? Is it better to have a slightly closed or flat racket at contact? Both are correct. Let's talk about it, Matthew. Let's talk about it. So when you hit a forehand, it's important that you are swinging up. Now, whether you're someone who really tries to go from below the ball to above the ball with this kind of movement, I don't teach that a lot. I teach more just go from below the ball to above the ball and don't worry so much about this because in my experience, there's a, um, a lot of players, they actually get worse when they try to make that move on purpose. If you look at the pros, they have their racket typically slightly closed when they strike the ball, which is why the top spin pro is angled. That's what really produces a great disparity between where your strings are pointing and where the racket travels. Anytime you have, Matthew, a great disparity between where the strings point and where the racket travels, you get a lot of rotation on the ball. If you swing extremely fast, then you can get away with your racket face a few degrees closed at contact. If you do not have a tremendous amount of racket speed, and thank you again for all of you who um, did the super thanks, absolutely incredible with the comments. It like has just, <laughs> I, I, I'm speechless. Thank you all again for all the super thanks. And if you're loving this, it would mean the world to me if you did. Uh, and you can buy stickers as well. If you're not swinging super fast, then having the racket face forward at contact is what you're looking for. But either way, Matthew, here's the key. Instead of worrying so much about the contact and you know, racket straight up and down or racket slightly closed as you hit the ball, what you really wanna focus on is the closed racket face. This is the missing link for players who don't get enough topspin compared to players who do get the topspin they're looking for. When you drop your racket down, you need to tilt your strings toward the ground. And you do that by turning your palm to the ground. So take the racket high, and then when you drop the racket, tilt your strings down toward the ground. I think I have a mirror here, yep. Here's a handheld mirror, right? When you drop the racket, point the mirror at the ground. So if you're someone who has a mirror like this, a handheld mirror, drop the racket down or drop the mirror down and tilt the mirror at the ground. If you're a coach, it's a great way to explain it. Use a handheld mirror, drop the mirror down, keep the mirror facing the ground until you get to the ball. The mirror is where your strings are pointing. Strings are closed. Now you can spin and get the ball to rotate. So there's so much emphasis on power, but ultimately spin. Like people are talking about, people ask me all the time, how do I deal with 
like pushers? How do I deal with moon ballers? How do I deal with people who bounce the ball and the ball jumps up on me? I don't get a lot of people asking, how do I hit that shot? I get people asking, how do I um, defend against it? But let's show empathy and say, you know, I want to put myself in my opponent's shoes. How are they producing that ball that is super, super um, frustrating to deal with? So tilt your strings down, swing up super fast, get that ball to rotate. How do I achieve a higher contact point on my serve? That's a great question. Now, Samantha, you might think this is um, counterintuitive. I'm gonna tell you actually to, cut, to toss lower. Here's why. Most players, and I'd have to actually see your serve, Samantha, but most players toss the ball too high. So here's what happens. They toss the ball way too high, so they have to wait. And they have to wait for the ball to drop. And in doing so, they, it's hard to time. So they end up actually waiting for the ball too long and the contact is low. So the first thing I would actually say without even seeing your serve, Samantha, is toss lower. What that does is it makes it easier to time so that your swing has to keep going. And it's actually easier to now contact up near the peak. Another idea, Samantha, is to try to hit serves where you're hitting the ball or you're attempting, because it's nearly impossible, but I want you to attempt hitting the ball while it's rising. I want you to toss the ball, and as the ball, let me get a, got a sponge ball here, as the ball is going up, you try to hit it. By attempting to hit the ball while it's rising, what you will do is quicken up your swing and you will contact the ball higher. So toss a little lower than you normally do. I know it's counterintuitive, but in my experience, people who toss way too high, contact too low because they have to wait for the ball to come down. They wait too long and then they end up contacting low and try with that lower toss to actually quicken the swing to contact on the way up. Thank you again for all of you. If you are loving this, this um, live uh, show here or live class, it would mean the world to me with the super thanks and super stickers. I really, really appreciate it. Let's keep going here. <clears throat> How can I promote a loose wrist so I can generate more power on my serve? Paul, great question. Here we go, Paul. When you lift your racket up, I want you to lift the racket up with a curled wrist. So if you look at, uh, like Djokovic is a, is a you know, common person who does this. When he lifts the racket up, he lifts it like this. You see a lot of players, a lot of recreational players, when they toss the ball, they immediately get the tip of the racket to point up. That produces wrist extension. Wrist extension is a tight, position. Wrist flexion, right? If I fall asleep, my racket's not going to be like this. If I fall asleep, all of a sudden my wrist is curled, up, curled over because I'm loose. So when you lift your racket up, I want you to think if you have a wristband, you know, like a sweatband on your wrist, I want you to think of lifting the racket for more, for a looser wrist. I want you to lift the racket up with the wrist curled over that instantly gets your forearm looser and your wrist looser. It also means that the racket has a farther distance to travel in the same amount of time, which is the definition of speed, right? Distance over time. With Samantha's idea about contacting too low, I'm sorry, with the contact point, if you couple a low toss with the wrist in this position, now you've got to swing really fast in a short amount of time, which creates the environment for looseness and racket speed. I love all these questions. I, I like doing videos where I know the script, but I love doing uh, live things. I do, I go live on, um, on Instagram all the time, especially when I'm picking up my kids. You got it, Samantha. Um, uh, hey, I was wondering how to change into the continental grip. I'm having difficulty with the pronation, keeping, changing the forehand grip mid-serve. Lucas, great question. I'm gonna give you a tip. First off, for all of you who are using your forehand grip or all of you who are coaches trying to help your students get away from a forehand grip, we first want to understand why we want the continental grip and the benefits of it so that we can actually, you know, promote that and encourage it happening. The problem with a forehand grip is that we tend to get underspin on the ball. Now, if any of you are golfers, you know that when you hit a golf ball, the ball has backspin. So the ball actually rises puts high pressure on the bottom, of the bottom of the ball, and the ball actually goes up. That is why we don't want backspin and why we don't want to contact low, as, as Samantha was saying, where we're pulling the ball down. We end up getting backspin on the ball. 
So what I would tell you, if you're trying to use a continental grip on the serve, embrace the fact that you get side spin. Embrace the fact that you're going to spin the ball. So let me see who it was. I wanna make sure I get the name right. Yeah, Lucas. So Lucas, the way to promote using a continental grip for your serve and not changing halfway to a, a forehand grip is to use the spin that comes from a continental grip, which is side spin. Let me break down the Top Spin Pro here. With all of my students, because you were talking about pronation, don't worry about pronation. I'm not saying it's not important. I'm saying if you're someone who's changing to a, con to a, a, a forehand grip, it's because you're trying to hit flat. Don't hit flat, spin the ball. So I want you to do this, like you're a basketball player spinning a basketball on your finger. I want you to spin the ball like it's the earth. I know the earth is tilted. I'm just saying if it were straight up and down, right? I want you to spin the ball. So, you know, toss the ball low, bend your knees, start exploding up as you hit the birthday hat, and then hit side spin. For all of my students who use a continental grip at first, I teach them all to hit side spin serves. I do not let them attempt a flat serve because that their brain goes, well, I could go through the pain of pronation and learning, or I could just change my grip and hit flat, which is what people do. So no more flat serves. I want you hitting side spin when you are using, uh, when you're attempting that continental grip. I will say though, when the ball goes left, if you're right-handed, you just have to aim right. So aim to the right, hit side spin, spin the ball, get the ball to spin like the earth, and then you will not change the grip as often, all right? Thank you again for all of you who gave super thanks. If you do a comment, you can actually leave a tip for this live Zoom, so thank you, or uh, live class, so thank you. Uh, hey, Ryan, great coaching. Thanks so much, IBX. Really appreciate it. Uh, how to return fast serves. Would you ever play a match against intuitive tennis? I actually, I was just talking to Nick today. Uh, we talk probably like once a week on Instagram DM. Uh, we, we leave like voice messages back and forth. We talk often. Um, I, I actually wouldn't. Uh, I'm up in Pennsylvania. He's down in Florida. There would be very little, like when you run a business, there's like cost benefit, right? What would be the benefit? Uh, it would cost a lot of money. It would wreak havoc with my family and my two kids and getting them to school and my wife works. There's just, the, the logistics of it is just not worth it for one of us to travel to the other. For one video, it would cost a ton for the airfare and it's just, it's just not worth it. Um, I would love it. Uh, he, I'm sure he'd beat me. I, ma I maxed out at a 5-0 level and you know he's, he's a higher level player, so I'm sure he would kick the crap out of me, but that's not why. I, it's not like I play other matches against people I, I feel like I'd beat. I just, I'm not interested when it comes to that because usually matches, they actually don't do very well with the, with the, um, with the algorithm. Like it just, it just, people don't really enjoy watching matches like that. I feel like sometimes when I serve, my grip is too loose when I come in contact. Any tips? Sure. One thing you can do, and this is something that, um, is not often talked about is how often are you all re-gripping re your racket? So a lot of times the racket can slip in your hand or you feel like your hand is too loose and at, during contact. People talk, and by the way, I have a broken string here. Um, people talk about what string tension do you have or what string should I use? And people aren't re-gripping their racket. Don't use a black grip like this. <laughs> Don't do what I do here. Use a white grip because then you can see when it's dirty and it makes you want to change your grip. So that's a nice little hack there. A lot of times people, their grip is so slippery and they don't even realize it. I'll be giving them a lesson and I'll, you know, they'll hand me their racket or I'll grab it and I'll say, oh my gosh, this grip is so slippery. How do you even play with this? And then you re-grip their racket and they're like, oh, now I, it's amazing. The racket doesn't twist in my hand. So make sure you're re-gripping your racket. I struggle with moon ballers on my forehand side, short high top spin with no pace. What strategy should we have? Also, should we have a racket lag for those high balls? I wouldn't worry about racket lag so much. What I will say is this, you don't wanna drive those balls. If you have a high forehand, don't drive it. It's the reason players struggle with that ball is because they usually try to hit it hard. I'm not saying that's for you, I'm just saying in most cases, people try to hit that ball way too hard. Well, what I would rather you do is two things hit the ball back with a high point like this, like a nice and high over the net. And I really want you to catch the racket. Most players, when they hit high balls, they pull the ball down with their follow through. 
I want you to spin the ball back and I want you to catch the racket high in your opposite hand. Watch how, more how much more consistent you are. You hit the net less and you hit the ball deep on them. Uh, hey Ryan, uh, at the point of contact, my racket sometimes wobbles. So this is really common if a player hits very flat. If you're hitting the ball and you're truly hitting it like this, if you're truly spinning the ball, where you're leading with the edge of the racket, spinning like this, usually the racket does not wobble. Wobbling usually occurs when you hit very flat into it, but if you're coming from underneath the ball and spinning it like this, hitting the ball off kilter, getting the ball to rotate, the ball will not wobble, or the racket won't wobble. So work on spinning up the back of the ball. Uh, is knocking off the birthday hat essential? I do not do it and my serve is the best part of my game and a few players do not. No. Knocking off the birthday hat is not essential. It is not mandatory. And if your serve is awesome and you do not hit the birthday hat, don't start hitting the birthday hat. The birthday hat is like braces for your teeth. Does everyone need braces? No. Does everyone who has perfect teeth, have they had braces? No. A couple players who do not hit the birthday hat. My favorite player of all time, Pete Sampras, does not hit the birthday hat. Um, Shapovalov does not hit the birthday hat. Uh, even um, Ash Barty, she, can't, she would go this way, so it would almost be like she was chopping off a ponytail, uh, you know, more than this movement. The reason I teach the birthday hat, you have to think of it as the birthday hat is like a surgeon for a broken arm, and it's a cast you put on to fix it. Nobody's trying to fix a broken arm if the, if the arm is fine, right? So it's the same idea. The birthday hat is for people who go palm up with their racket. If your strings are facing up and you're not staying supinated and you're not bringing that racket around in a circular fashion, that's when you need to actually have the birthday hat. But no, the birthday hat is not mandatory and I would never force it on someone who loves their serve, uh, hits a great serve. If Sampras had been my coach, I would not have taught him the, uh, oh my gosh, Vivek, <laughs> thank you so much. You guys are amazing. Uh, thank you, thank you, thank you. You guys are amazing. I really, really appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, so no, you do not have to hit the birthday hat. Thank you, Vivek. Can I buy the single playbook outside of the US and Germany? Yes, you can. Please use my link. It would mean the world to me. So um, if you need it, you can... Um, I'm actually gonna be making one of those videos later today. I make about three videos a week doing the, uh, the singles and doubles playbooks. But if you would like Vivek, or no, that was not Vivek. Who was that? Uh, Joachim. So Joachim, please, Fisher, uh, send me an email, ryan at twominutetennis.net. It's the number two, not T-W-O, numeric, number two, ryan at twominutetennis.net. And I will gladly send you my link. You can also go to one of my recent strategy, single strategy videos, and you'll see it in the, in the description and pinned in the first comment. Thank you so much. It really helps me out. You guys are amazing. I so appreciate the super thanks. Thank you, Vivek. Uh, my one-handed backhand can only hit at a comfortable height. How can I have com um, be comfortable dealing with high and low balls? So let's talk about uh, let's talk about the high ball. So a high backhand. Yes, you can hit a slice, but let's try to figure out how we can hit a top spin high backhand. First off, we have to make sure that we get the grip over. We have to get the grip far enough. So we have to have the grip all the way on top. So you want, uh, let me show you this. First off, does everyone know how to find a grip? You always want your racket on its edge. There are eight panels. We're looking at an octagon here. You put your racket on edge and the top panel is panel number one. This is panel number two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. If you're right-handed, if you're a lefty, this is panel one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, right? Panel one is always on top. I call them panels, by the way, because most players get confused when I say bevel because they think a bevel is a corner where the two panels come together. A bevel is a side, but I like saying panels because it's super easy. We want to put the base knuckle. You guys are awesome. Thank you for the super thanks and the stickers. It means the world to me, and I'll definitely shout you out when you give it. Your Thank you. so. I, oh, my gosh. I cannot pronounce your name. But thank you so, so much for the super thanks. I can see your face. 
You got like a goatee like me, though you're probably better looking. That's not difficult uh, to be better looking than me. But your knuckle and your heel pad, those two spots have to go, whoops, have to go for a one-handed backhand on panel number one, the very top. So you take those two spots, you place them square up on the very top of the racket. That is gonna help you hit a high backhand with topspin. Let me show you one without a racket that's got a broken string on it. The next thing is when you're hitting a high backhand, don't think of hitting pure topspin. You actually have to think of going across up into the left. Think of going from on a clock from like 7.30 to 1.30. You're going up and across because it's nearly impossible to get pure topspin on a high backhand, uh, whether it's one-hander or two-hander. So you do want to swing up and out. When it comes to the low backhand, I would very much recommend that you hit a slice. And what I call it is an underspin. One reason why players struggle with an underspin backhand is because they use what is conventionally taught, which is a continental. And what's typically done with a continental grip for players who struggle with slice is their racket is way too open. Believe it or not, on a slice backhand, your racket is less than 10 degrees open, right? So if it's a high slice, your racket straight up and down when you hit the ball. When it is a low slice, your racket is open by 10 degrees. So what you can actually do for your slice backhand, if you're the type of player who pops their ball open and like the ball always pops up when you hit a slice, it's because players think that the racket face is open. Any of you golfers know that if you take your like 60 degree wedge or 63 degree wedge, like the club face is wide open, the ball pops up. So you actually want your racket face very straight up and down at contact, and that will send a low ball nice and low over the net, and then the ball won't pop up. And you can do that by changing your grip a little farther. So don't use your typical slice grip for that low backhand. Change your grip a little farther, not all the way to the top spin that I just showed you, but kind of on the corner between panels two and one. For a lefty, it's here. And by turning the racket a little more, you square up the racket and then the ball goes nice and low over the net. Thank you again. Everyone is being so supportive with these uh, super thanks and these stickers. I'm shocked. Uh, when I try to hit a powerful one-handed backhand, my shot feel like it's sliced too much uh, and I hit it awkward. Yes. Okay. So similar to the top spin forehand, let me show you what is probably happening. I'm going to put together my my Topspin Pro here. When you hit a powerful, you got it, Lynn, thanks so much. When you hit a powerful for, uh, backhand or forehand, we wanna make sure that we close the racket face. Closing the racket face simply means that you tilt your racket toward the ground. When you tilt your racket toward the ground, then you can spin up the back of the ball. And it doesn't matter how hard you hit, you're gonna get the spin that you're looking for. What typically occurs is players have their racket straight up and down. I think I have a coin here, yeah. What you do not want is to be able to balance a coin on the edge of the racket. If you can balance a coin on the edge of your racket, you are gonna have problems when trying to hit consistent topspin because you're gonna have to hit very flat and it's actually why people hit slice on those balls. You want to drop below the ball, so turn high. Two heads are better than one, two headed monster. Then you want to drop below the ball and your strings point down. When you close the racket face, even on a ball you want to drive and hit hard, you've got to close the racket face a bit. And then you can spin and really hit the heck out of that ball. And that ball is going to have a ton of spin and a ton of consistency. All right, let's see what we got here. We've been on for 43 minutes. We got 112 people on. I love your lessons and following most of your clips. The techniques are good, clear, easy to follow. Thanks, Doppler. Really appreciate it. Somebody had a mental toughness. Um, how often should I replace my strings? Is after six matches enough? Yeah, replace them as much as you want, Aiden. I would say more important than changing your strings is replacing your grip because they get slimy, dirty, slippery, and you don't even realize it. It's like when you put on a new pair of jeans or like a new t-shirt or new sneakers, you're like, oh wow, I now realize how worn out my other ones were. Put on new grips very often. There's a good chance since you're asking about your strings that you may be neglecting how often you put a new grip on. I would put a new grip on, you could put a new grip on every single match. Get a replacement grip. You can get a bunch of them, they're super cheap. And you put a new grip on, you get that new grip feeling every single match. 
people were talking about mental toughness. One of the things I would be very um, excited to tell you about is I'm, I'm a big believer in being positive off the court, not just on the court. So I like positive affirmations. You want to do, I do these with my kids every day. You want to be super positive and believe in yourself. If you're talking negatively, like, oh, I can never beat that guy or my backhand sucks or my serve never goes in. Guess what? Your body is going to make you right because they're going to prove to you that you were right. See, I told you my backhand sucks. See, I told you my, for my serve never goes in. No, no, no. You want to be positive. Be positive off the court. Being positive off the court is going to help you be positive on the court. Don't be super negative. You'll find that it doesn't help you play better. How would you fix someone's bad habit of thinking too much with upper body instead of lower body? Sure. Um, one of the things I would do is if it, if it were my student, I would give them something to do, whether it was split step or keep their feet really wide. And while they're playing, if they don't do it, I would automatically give the point to the opponent. So I, I'm a big believer in, in creating the scoring system based around what you taught them. So let's say someone is used to hitting slice backhands and they, and they always go to it when they're playing a match and they get nervous and they just slice, slice. And you're trying to get them to hit their better shot, which is their top spin or develop that shot, but they're too timid and they just end up hitting slice. And they come to you saying, hey, can Ryan, can you give me advice? I'm sick of hitting my slice backhand. I really, in a match, want to go for my top spin. I say, sure, let's I'm going to bring in another student. I'm going to have you play. Every time you hit a slice backhand when you're not supposed to, you automatically lose the point. Even if your shot goes in, I'm going to automatically you know, lose the point. If their second serve is too slow, let's say they always hit short uh, on their forehand. Okay, great. Create a game where if their ball lands in front of the service line, they lose the point automatically. You want to create the environment where they don't just lose the point because they hit the net. They don't just lose the point because they hit the ball long. They don't just lose the point because the ball double bounces. They also lose the point if they don't do what is, um, what is the focal point of that drill. And that really and instantly changes the behavior. Yeah, thank you so much. And thank you all for the super thanks and the stickers when you guys comment you can leave a super thanks and uh, the tip it's amazing so thank you all so much i can't believe all the donations um to do, 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 do what weekly schedule would you recommend to someone who is on uh, his way to his first atp point da, 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 da. to be honest with you i have no clue because that is not my wheelhouse i teach beginners i teach intermediate players i teach advanced club players Helping out with points and ATP, I have n I know nothing about it, so I apologize. I would definitely reach out if I were you to Felix from uh, Tennis Bros and uh, you know just follow what he's doing, and I'm sure he'll be able to help you. Maybe comment on one of his videos. Uh, any on tips on what to do after losing your forehand? I used to be able to hit good forehands, but this week suddenly just lost it. Sure, what I would absolutely do is film your forehand. I would film it, compare it to what you're looking at on my, I would just go on YouTube, two minute tennis, forehand and look for videos. I make a ton of them. I try to put up two videos every single day. I try to put up more content than any of my competition to just let them know that sure, you might make better videos than me, but you're not going to make more videos than I do. Um, and then film yourself and compare what you see with your video to my forehand analysis where I teach you how to analyze your forehand. And then just compare, look for ways that you can make the, uh, the necessary adjustments. Get a Topspin Pro using my link, thank you so much, and then practice the, the techniques and you'll find your forehand again. Uh, I have started playing tennis last year and I have the bad habit of moving my front most foot forward when I serve. Should I try to change this? I see David Ferrer has a similar style. Yeah, let me show you why. Thanks so much guys for the, uh, for the tips. Thank you so much for the super thanks. I really appreciate you guys with the, with the stickers and everything, unbelievable. Let me show you why people move their foot. So I'm gonna tilt this down here. I got a, a baseline here. This is really common. People move their foot all the time. It's usually one of two reasons why people move their foot. They move their foot because their front foot is too parallel to the net. And when they turn, they're gonna hurt their knee. So they toss and they turn and then foot fault or they pick their foot up. That's one reason why people move their foot. Another reason is their feet are too close or they don't want their, they don't like how close their feet are. So when they toss, they move this foot to get their feet wider. 
So I would stand farther apart with your feet and I would make sure that your front foot is more angled forward and you'll find out that that front foot does not move. I absolutely guarantee that will fix your front foot moving. Get your front foot to face more forward and start with your feet farther apart. Watch how your front foot stays more forward. I know I don't turn my body enough before hitting my forehand, but can't get used to it at all. Could you please help? Lynn 711, you got, you absolutely got it. So to turn your body more, let me see exactly how you said it. To turn the body enough. All right. Oh, Lynn, can you quickly answer? Are you talking about the initial turn or the turn when you're hitting? Just write initial turn or turn while hitting, like the coiling or the uncoiling. I just wanna wait for Lynn to respond to this question because I wanna make sure that I'm answering correctly here. Let's see, Lynn. Lynn, I'm gonna give you 10 seconds to respond. Let's see, and then I gotta go on to the next one. Initial, awesome, thank you so much. All right, so Lynn, a couple things. First, I want you to think of your left shoulder if you're right-handed. Think of your front shoulder and turn showing the back shoulder to your opponent. What you could do, hey, Ryan just joined. What's up, JJ? What's going on? So what I want you to think of is, um, Lynn, set your phone at the net. Set your phone up at the net. And when you are hitting, the camera is facing you. What I want you to do on your forehand is turn with both hands. Maybe wear a t-shirt, Lynn, that has writing on the back. And when you turn, try to see the writing on your shirt. So use the camera that you rest against the net on the ground facing you. Use that to see if you can show the back of your front shoulder and then hit. You can also just make sure that your non-hitting hand is on the racket as you take it back. So one thing I ask my students to do, Lynn, is to take the racket back with just their hitting arm. Take the racket back with just your hitting arm as a way to practice it. You could do it like this, right? You could do, the, do this with me right now. Forget about your dominant hand, use your non-dominant hand, your non-hitting hand just going back. That, that teaches you to take it back with just your non-hitting hand and then you let go and hit. But using the, the camera filming you uh, will make all the difference in the world to make sure that you're showing the back of your shirt to the net. Here we go. Any tips for serving out wide on the deuce side as a righty? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so it's really simple. The ball goes where your strings point. So as you're hitting the ball, the goal is to have your right edge in front. So as you're hitting the ball, keep your right edge in front as you're hitting the ball. Now you will pronate, but at the moment of contact, you want your strings facing out wide. Now, if you really want the ball to curve, then don't swing towards your target you gotta swing to the right. So the ball goes to the left because the strings are facing left because your right edge is in front if you're right-handed. If you're a lefty, it's the opposite, right? The left edge is in front. But by swinging to the right as a righty, now the ball is curving and pulls out even more. Let's see here. Thank you again. You got it, Lynn, I really appreciate it. How do I punch through a backhand volley rather than cut? Oh my gosh, I'm super excited. JJ, you're ready for me to make a couple people mad? All, everyone's been singing my praises here. Thank you so much. I really appreciate these lives. Watch how all of a sudden everyone's going to go, wait, what did he just say? All right, you ready for this? Who was that again? JJ. Don't use the same grip on your forehand and backhand volley. <laughs> I've got 109 people on right now. Let's see if it goes to three, because they're all going to be like, I'm out of here. This guy's lost his mind. The reason you are chopping on your backhand, JJ, is because you are using the same grip on your forehand and backhand. What is taught in the industry, and it comes from the certifications, is use the same grip on both sides because there's not enough time to change which is completely false. There is enough time to change 95% of the time. So for that 95% of the time, change your grip a little bit farther over, more toward the Eastern backhand, not all the way. Yeah, you got it. Thanks so much, uh, uh, QSH. Thank you so much. Oh, you've lost your mind. I know, right? I know. See, what happens is people say I've lost my mind, 
But this guy, JJ, is saying, hey, I'm using the continental grip, but I'm chopping on my backhand. There are two reasons he's chopping. It's because the racket face is open because of the continental, and he's setting the racket up above the head. So, yeah, I'm telling you, uh, the USTA. Exactly, exactly. Trust me, I'm, I'm on the crap list for uh, USPTA. What you want to do is change your grip a little bit farther. Now, all the people who try it go, oh my gosh, this is so much better. All the people who don't try it and the coaches tell me I'm wrong. But the only people I really care about are the players who try my information and know it works. So instead of using a continental grip, which forces you to chop the racket, change your grip a little bit farther and then you have a more square racket against the back of the ball. You can still put a little backspin on it for control. But now all of a sudden it squares up the racket. This is why you watch pros and they go forward on their forehand volley and chop down on their backhand volleys because they're using a one grip system. If they were to change their grip on the backhand, and by the way, it takes less time to change your grip than it does to even put the racket to the side. It takes less time to change your grip than it does to turn and step 95% of the time. Then do that. And then all of a sudden you can actually hit a square ball into the back, a square racket into the back of the ball. And for that one out of 20 times when, and I know what you're thinking, when you're playing doubles and the opponent poaches and you don't have enough time, well then don't change your grip. If you don't have enough time to change your grip, then you won't, right? If I don't have enough time to stop for coffee on the way to a tennis lesson or wherever, then I don't. Like people always say, yeah, but what if you don't have enough time? Well, then you don't have enough time. But trust me, 95% of the time, if I offered all of you $10 million to hit a forehand volley and then change your grip and hit a backhand volley, you'd all do it. And you'd prove to yourself that you do have time to do it. Uh, so for JJ, turn the grip a little bit farther on the backhand. Watch how the racket is more square against the back of the ball. And then you won't have to set the racket above the ball and chop. You can set the racket where the ball is going to arrive and go forward. You have plenty of time to change your grip. Anyone who says that they don't have enough time to change their grip, I know they've never tried it. All right, let's see what we got here. Uh, all righty, thanks, Ryan. I was just about to head to the course, but I saw your live stream, so I hopped on. I'll try it. Thanks so much, JJ. Let me know. Uh, your videos and teach them to my son. You're a great teacher. Thank you. You got it, Armin. Thanks so much. For all of you, by the way, I'm looking at the super thanks. For all of you, trust me, this is my business. If I give you any amount of value whatsoever, day after day after day, it is not easy to create a channel and to keep it running and to keep it at the top. Um, I, I'm, I, I, I'm creating content every single day for you, this is my business, this is what I do for a living, is I, I run an online business. I coached for 24 years at a tennis club, about an hour north of Philadelphia. And last year, it became smarter for me to stop working on court and to have affiliate links and to run Zoom lessons and to do these classes. Um, uh, I have a question, Santosh, go ahead, say your question. Uh, see, if you would have just written your question, I could have read it. Um, so if you have the ability to leave a tip here, if you love this live stream, it would mean the world to me. All you got to do is click that super thanks under the video if you're not watching this live, but I am doing this live right now. Um, uh, but yeah, 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 it's, uh, it, it means the world to me. All right, let's see here. Uh, footwork from baseline on short balls. Feel like I'm always late. I have to run to square up rather than unit turn first and then approach the ball. Um, yeah, so that's a hard one. You want to think of run first, turn second. But there are extremes here. So some people run like this and they get there late. You don't want to run fast with your racket behind you. You watch the pros. They get a short ball. They run first, then they turn. So it's not easy because it is a per ball situation. But if the ball is high and you have plenty of time, get the racket back early. If the ball is short and you're going to have to really struggle to get there, you pump your arms, maybe reach forward and hit underspin. Uh, and not take a big swing. That's one where it really is a per situation basis. Who do you think is hotter? Sissy Poss and Borna <laughs> It's ridiculous. How to return a kick serve. One of the easiest ways to return a kick serve is just to stand way back at the fence. If you're struggling with a kick serve, let me show you this. This is one of the mistakes that recreational players make all the time. Uh, and I, I would make it too. Like if this isn't my job, right? I, I would make this mistake too. Players do not adjust where they stand to return serve. If you're someone who is, let me see here. I got to like, I feel like it's not very clear. I don't know why. Um, but if you're struggling returning serve, you don't have to always stand here. You can always back up. You watch, 
Ch you watch um, Nadal, you watch Dominic Team against really strong kick serves, they often stand way back. Now, here's what happens. People go, yeah, but Ryan, if you stand back, then they can slice it out wide. Okay, force them to. I mean, if you keep doing what you're doing, you're gonna keep getting what you're getting. I appreciate you saying that it's clear, Prem. I don't know why, it just looked like smoky. Um, I thought maybe like the lens was a little smudged. But move back and force them to hit the out wide. A lot of times when you back up, you're now forcing them into a serve that they don't want to, to make or, or hit. So if you're struggling with a kick serve, returning it, stand way back and then watch their kick serve doesn't really give you any trouble. Do you recommend jogging, running to improve cardio? Da, 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 too much stress on the knees. It, I, I wouldn't recommend, tennis isn't really cardio. It's not like you're just running. So a lot of people who run, yeah, it is stressful on the knees. But what ends up happening is you're not actually helping yourself be ready for tennis, which is up, down, up, down, up, down, right? Heart, heart rate up, get the heart rate down. Heart rate up, heart, heart rate down. So I would do more short interval, inter, uh, interval stuff. Actually, things that only last three, four, five seconds because tennis points are very short. Uh, they're not long like we think. I have a question regarding teaching kids. Should I wait till the age of eight for changing the red ball to orange ones? Or can I change ball stages depending on the progress of the child. Yeah, look, what I wouldn't do is race them through those levels. I think a lot of times, parents especially, they think, well, my child is red and they're really good, so they need to go to orange. Well, I'm a big believer that you can teach them more in a certain situation, uh, a, you know, whether it's red or yellow or the green dot, before you move on to the next. Uh, that's just what I think. A lot of times it's just because, oh, they can hit the ball over the net. They need to go to orange, uh, or they won a tournament. So they need to go to, to green, but they're not really learning the skills of a slice backhand or finishing up above their head to dip the ball at someone's feet. Who's coming in. I would look at increasing the skills acquired at a certain level rather than they have a, a, a limited number of skills and they just progress to the next ball. Um, think more about skill development and targets and shots. You know, can they hit a, a high slice backhand, a medium slice backhand, a low slice backhand? Are they using proper footwork when returning serve, split, turn, hit, step? There are so many things that you want to do at each level, but a lot of times what we do is we advance the ball. So now the ball's coming faster and they don't have the time to develop those, those more difficult shots. So a slow ball does have the benefit of being able to teach those more intricate skills. Let's see it. Ryan, greeting from Boston. Curious about your view on pickleball and will you consider doing videos of it in the future? Um, speaking now, I won't consider doing pickleball. I've played it. I find it boring, but that doesn't mean that other people don't love it. Um, but chances are I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna be making pickleball content. Uh, am I ruining my tennis uh, potential if I like to build muscle at the gym? No, you are not. Uh, do, 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 do. do you recommend a recommend? Do you have a recommended frequency of various shots of tennis? Top spin, serve, slice, drop shot. I'm not understanding what you're saying. Are you saying when you're practicing or when you're playing a match? Um, I'm not sure what your question is. Let's see here. Uh, if you have a question, let me know. Please, please throw it here. Okay, here we go. Dr greetings from Australia. Down the T, thanks so much. How to add pace safely to a kick serve. Um, oh, when you're practicing, okay, I gotcha. Uh, feel like my kick has a lot of Thompson, but it doesn't go deep enough and my friends stand past the baseline and punish it. Yeah, Daniel. Yeah, it's really common. So what you wanna do is toss more forward into the court. So a lot of players, they know to toss behind them to be able to spin up the back, but if they let the ball land, it would either land behind the baseline or on the baseline. Practice tossing more forward into the court so that the ball would land inside the baseline quite a bit, and you'll see how your uh, kick serve has more pace. When talking about the frequency, what I like to do is this. I mentioned this at the beginning. Thank you all again for spending time with me. I've been on here for 63 minutes. Uh, I got 105 people on, 75 likes. Um, the super thanks uh, and the tips that you've all left for me, the super stickers and the super thanks means the world to me. So thank you all so, so much. There are five situations in tennis, and I explained this at the very, very beginning of this live stream. Uh, you're either serving, you're returning, 
you're rallying, your opponent's coming to the net. What's up, Josh? Thanks for just joining. Or you're not, or your opponent's coming to the net. Those are the six situations. What I like to do in every single lesson with my students is serve and return. They serve and they return because those are the two things that like always happen. Then we practice something with rallying. I'm coming to the net. They're coming to the net. And every single lesson, they know that they're going to serve and hit returns. And then I choose one of these to work on. And then we play out points at the end. They have to, we're working on the serve, we're working on the return, and then I'm testing them and their ability to either do the right thing with rallying, like hitting cross court or hitting very deep, coming to the net, hitting like deep approach shots, um, or I'm coming to the net, making sure they're hitting at my feet. So instead of thinking frequency, think of the situations in tennis, serving, returning, rallying, you're going to the net and your opponent's coming to the net, and work on those situations and and build your lesson around those situations. And now you're actually practicing in a way that actually benefits your play. Guys, we got about five minutes less. You do an amazing job. Thanks so much. Keep up the good work, going to sleep. It's late in India. Yes, it is. Uh, let's see here. Missed the stream, but we'll watch it back. Thanks so much. Thanks so much. Players, I really appreciate it. I'm gonna head up now um, and uh, I actually got to prepare for my second video I'm going to make on YouTube. First off, I want to thank you for supporting me. I want to thank you. Bye. Thank you so much, T Piano. Thanks for the vids. You got it, 600. I want to thank you for supporting me. This is my job. Uh, you know, YouTube is monetized. And when it comes to my affiliate links, if you're going to get a, a, a doubles playbook or singles playbook from Fuzzy Yellow Balls, thanks, Carl. Please use my link. If you're going to get a Topspin Pro, please use my link. If you want to buy something, reach out to me. Ryan at two minute tennis.net and ask for my affiliate link. It'll take three seconds. Thanks, Lucas. Thanks, guys. Uh, thanks so much. But you know what you can also do is you can leave a super thanks. If you ever watch one of my videos and you love it and it helps you, even if you love this live stream, it would mean the world to me if you went into the comment section right now and you just left a super thanks um, and bought a super sticker. It means the world to me and my family. This is, this is how I live, right? So thank you all so, so much. If you have any other questions, feel free to throw them in the description below. Um, if you have any questions, uh, could you make a video controlling your emotions, the easiest on court? Yeah, that's not easy. I will make a video on that at some point. Um, and, you know, if, if there is a video in the future that you want me to make, by the way, ever think of writing a book on tennis? Uh, Jason, um, I have, but I'm... Uh, uh, it, to me, I'm more of like a video personal kind of guy, but write a book, yeah. I, I absolutely would. Um, but if there is a video you would like me to make, please put it in the comments below. Thank you all for the super thanks. Thank you for the tips that you've left here and the stickers. It means the absolute world to me. What is your channel's goal? My goal is to help as many recreational players as possible gain confidence and win more matches and play much better tennis. I'm the kind of coach who likes to deal with beginners, intermediate, and like lower advanced club players. That is my wheelhouse. It is who I love to coach. If, if a pro tennis player asked me to be their coach, I would decline. I don't find that interesting. I don't, look at the energy that I've just brought here for the past 70 or 68 minutes. I get so amped up about teaching two fives, three O's, three fives, four O's, four fives, club level tennis players. Um, I, it just gets me so excited. If I was talking to my wife earlier today, I'm a better, better husband. I'm a better father. I'm a better person when I have taught tennis that day because I absolutely love it. So thank you all so, so much. And you got this.